Welcome to Curiously Caitlin, where we try to make theology make sense. Each week, we will hear a kid question about God, theology, or the Bible, and find a scholar who can answer it. We are making the show this way because I believe that theology is for everyone, and that us grown-ups need to learn from both kids and scholars when it comes to our theology. We hope that kids will listen too, but this is a show for grown-ups. That's especially true of this episode, because this kid question gets us into a conversation about sex. There's nothing graphic, but if you are listening to the show with your kids, which we love, you might want to listen to this one by yourself first, just to make sure you want your little ears hearing it, or so you're prepared for the questions they will have. Now, on to this kid question that almost stumped our biblical scholar this week. One more thing. This Thursday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Central, I'll be hosting a Holy Post live stream. Normally, these are only for Holy Post Plus subscribers, but we are making this one available to Curiously Caitlin listeners, too. It's your chance to hear more about the podcast and ask your own questions, even if you aren't a kid. Head over to holypost.com slash live for all the details. I don't know. That doesn't make any sense. Huh? Drew Johnson, thank you so much for being here today. And thank you for answering this kid question with me. My pleasure. It's a question I'm sure I had at one point as well. <laughs> this is Dr. Drew Johnson. He is visiting assistant professor at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, the director of the Center for Hebraic Thought, editor at The Biblical Mind, host of The Biblical Mind podcast, and co-host of the OnScript podcast. Let's hear this question. It has two parts to it. If Adam Eve... When they were made, were they just babies or were they just made as humans? I thought they eventually had kids, mm -hmm. and so I think they do. And so even if they did have kids, so like basically, how would they know how to get the babies out and stuff? Because if the mom had a big tummy, they would have just thought that I have I had ate too much cantaloupe and I have a upset <laughs> stomach. A fantastic Legit. question. <laughs> yes, yes, a really that's good. So question. legitimate. <laughs> um, okay, so let's start with just the logistics of this story in Genesis, because I think what this kid is partially asking is just like, do I have the story right? Um, mm -hmm. So let's start with the first question that he asked. Were Adam yeah. and Eve, I think what he meant is, were Adam and Eve made as babies or as full grown adults? Yeah, um, I should point out that this is a, a legitimate question. I mean, that people have been wrestling with this question for thousands yeah. of years. So you go back to early Jewish uh, discussion of this by the rabbis. You might be thinking, who are the rabbis? Don't worry, we'll get to that later. They're trying to figure out exactly what was the state of humanity in creation and what what changes and um, even to the point where some people have suggested that knowledge of good and evil when they eat of the fruit is actually uh, puberty. Uh, so that's, that's mm. um, it's related to the sexual development, basically. Okay, so uh, were they babies? So this is going to get weir really weird for a little bit. <laughs> Go for it. Before it gets normal. <laughs> but when I say they've been wrestling with this, like, so Jewish rabbis do not hold back. Like, they go with every possible thought that could to work because they're trying to figure out what's going on. Just like this kid, they're like puzzling it through, going, yeah, I'm, yeah. I need to fit all the pieces together. Um, and I, I don't think that they were born as babies. Um, but we don't really have any time sequence. So the problem is the the, the man is, he, I hate to say, his, I, I can't call him Adam because he's not really, doesn't have a name. He's called mm -hmm. the Adam, the dirt lane, right? The man is is made from the dirt uh, and he's then commanded to eat from all the trees, warned about the one tree, and then the woman's made. And according to the narrative, it's like five minutes. I mean, there's no amount, <laughs> like... We have no sense of how long these people were alive when all of these things happened. Were they there for years or not? Um, but they do seem to be um, adult. And uh, here's one indication. The first thing we see when they leave the garden is, I mean, the, the very first sentence after out of the garden is they have sex and she conceives and, and bears uh, children. Um, the very first blessing of, <clears throat> excuse me, of God to the humans in Genesis 1 is to be fruitful and multiply. Mm 
So it seems like when we run into these people, our, everything that is being said about them and every inclination here is that they are they could be sexually active uh, creatures. They're at least potentially sexually active and for sure sexually active as soon as they leave the garden. And it seems like they prob might have been in the garden. I was talking about my this with my wife last night and we were trying to game out like, well, they couldn't have been there longer than nine months right, uh, because right. if they were having <laughs> sex, then maybe, you know. But um, yeah, it's it's an open question. And then what do they do on the flip side when uh, when somebody's pregnant as well? So I, I think it's a I think it's actually a good question. I'm not sure Genesis wants to answer the question of how old they were. <laughs> there yeah. there is another yeah. problem here is we tend to view children as innocent. The church has not uh, throughout history, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but because of what. Because of this movement in Germany, the Romanticist movement, we tend to have this really like cutified version of children of these innocent, blank slate things that that only can be corrupted. Romanticism was a philosophical movement towards the end of the 18th century that emphasized emotion and aesthetics, the importance of the individual and the imaginative or transcendental. We're still impacted by a lot of its ideas. However, as Dr. Johnson says, the church has consistently taught that all humans are fallen from birth, that even little children sin. One of my seminary professors used to joke that Pelagius, an early church theologian who taught that humans were basically good and whose ideas were condemned as heresy, only thought that way because he didn't have kids. But his opponent, Augustine, who had a child of his own, knew that kids also sin. <laughs> It's been noted that people like us in the West tend to have an overly simplified view that children are just innocent and pure. And so you can see people reading that back into the text saying, oh, no, they must have been children when they were created because they were pure and innocent. Um, but that's, again, just projecting back, uh, you know, current yeah. cultural ideas back onto the text. So, yeah, there's one thing you said in there I want you to explain, um, which is that you said you don't want to call him Adam because that's mm. not like the name given to him. Can you explain why you say that. Um, yeah. Uh, I should say, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in my scholarly job in Genesis 1 through 11. Um, so I get real crotchety about every little thing in there. So <laughs> I realize to. that this is being like overly uh, pedantic and being too, too detail oriented. But he's actually called by a title. I mean, the irony of God is called by his personal name, not by a title, uh, Yahweh, which is like Susan mm -hmm. or Clifton or something like that, right? Um, and the man is not called by a personal name. He's called by his title, Ha'adam, which means the Adam and Adam and Adama. It's a word play, like off the mm -hmm. word dirt, uh, Adama. So I, I don't call him, you could call him the earthling. Uh, that makes it sound like a sci-fi story. You could call him the soiling, <laughs> which makes it sound like he's done something wrong. Uh, so I think Dirtling is the one that kind of communicates. He's called the Dirtling because he's taken from the dirt. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is all the animals are also made from the dirt and also given the breath of life, just like him, and also <laughs> called living creatures just like him. So there becomes this puzzle where it's like, well, how is he different than all of these other dirt form creatures who have the breath of life and are being presented to him by God? Um, so almost, almost every instance in Genesis one through, or at least two and three, it says the man, the man, or Adam. And that's not what it says in the Hebrew. It says the dirtling, the dirtling, the dirtling. Because there is a word for man. It's ish. Mm, uh, yeah. um, and that is used when it says, behold, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, woman, because she was taken from ish. So there is a word for man, but that's not the word used in the Hebrew. So the, the author is taking a lot of care not to use the standard Hebrew word for man, but to call him uh, by the substance from which he was taken, which is where the word human comes from. Hummus, uh, the word hummus, which is the the, the soil, right, and human. Got, you great. got more than you asked for there. No, that's great. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, part of this still, this does relate to kind of the larger underlying question I think that this kid is getting at, which is not just some very legitimate questions about the mechanics of this yeah. story, yeah. but also underlying that is kind of a question about how we're supposed to take this story. Mm. Um, and as you just said a moment ago, you know, might be asking questions that the text isn't interested in, in answering or doesn't assume we will ask. Um, and this is a challenge, I think, especially for when we're talking to kids, but for all of us as we're continuing to learn and grow in the church, we're asking questions about how we should take certain mm -hmm. texts. So just considering this question that this kid asked, um, how would you describe 
how we should be taking this story or what kinds of questions are good questions for us to ask. And if they might be related to this question of, which I think is not just a question of the logistics, it's also a question of, as you said, it seems important that they are to be fruitful and multiply. So I have some questions about that. So how, how might we take this story, this text with those kinds of concerns in mind? Um, yeah, this is an ever popular question and everybody loves to talk about this with the, the creation accounts as well. Um, yes. <laughs> I will, I'm a minimalist. So I'm like, what can I say with a lot of confidence that I think everybody should take seriously here? Uh, and one of the things I think is all, all stories, all stories have an arrow through them that points them in a particular direction. Uh, and that's constructed in kind of conflict and resolution uh-huh. patterns, right? Uh, if you've been to high school, you know how narratives work, uh, character development, conflict resolution, height, plot tensioning, setting, et cetera. So I do think that we often kind of blow past those because we have all kinds of theological meanings we want to read into the text or derive from the text. And Mm. we don't ever stop and say, I mean, I do it every semester in a class. I say, okay, most of you have read this story before. You read it for your homework. We're reading it in class right now. What's the story about? And man, I get every answer under the sun, right? And I say, no, no, no. An author constructed the story with a particular structure in mind, which kind of helps eliminate what it's not about and focus you in on what it, what it is about. And uh, I've done that with churches. I've done that with all kinds. I've done that with Bible teachers in private Christian high schools. And they, you know, mm-hmm. I've yet to have people that can really clearly uh, on the fly say, oh, well, here's the conflict. It comes to resolution through this climax. So it's got to be about something like this, even if it's about other things. So. I think paying attention to the structure of the story, which even children, like young children, understand structure to story. They understand yeah. when stories aren't properly told or where the endings held away or something like that. So I, I think paying attention to the the structure of the story will help us focus on what the, the author wants us to pay attention to. Uh, a friend of mine used to tell this story about gossip in prayer, uh, prayer circles. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with this phenomenon of <laughs> or someone kind of, he he made up this story as an illustration of like you know did you hear Judy got arrested arrested for what we got to pray for her you know for for what <laughs> you know she got arrested for stealing stealing what did she steal she went into the, you know the convenience store and she stole tic tacs tic tacs what flavor and you're like that doesn't matter it doesn't right. <laughs> like the, the fact is Judy is in jail because she got arrested for stealing so I think there's some point where there's a natural line of questioning that you mm-hmm. pursue but you got to figure out when the question becomes irrelevant to what the yes. what the story you're trying to tell right and what's important about the story um so I think we have a lot more work to do on that front of paying closer attention to the stories you know uh, we're asking what color were the tic tacs and the author of Genesis is like I'm actually trying to point you down the line to this to this other thing that you need to know, which is why I think, uh, well, I don't know why, but Genesis one through three, I mean, it's the creation of the cosmos, humanity, and the kind of like the ruining of everything in three chapters. Um, And lots of scholars point out, you have 12 chapters about Joseph, who isn't even a patriarch, whose line is gonna die off by the time you get to second Kings uh, 16. Um, Why do we have 12 chapters for Joseph and only two to three chapters for the creation of the cosmos? That Mm -hmm. seems intentional. Um, and that it also means that every single sentence, every single word are like laser like trying to focus you and say, no, no, not that, not that. Um, but pay, pay attention to this. And remarkably, as you follow Genesis into Exodus, it really is the stuff that keep you focused on laser like in Genesis one through three that keeps coming up again and again and again mm. in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and beyond, even into the New Testament, I would say. And now a word from our sponsor. Wait, what's a sponsor? This episode is sponsored by Brazos Press. Brazos Press publishes books that creatively draw upon the riches of the Christian story to deepen our understanding of God's world and inspire faithful reflection and engagement. They also happen to be the publishing partner for two Holy Post hosts, Sky Jadhani and myself. What I love about Brazos is that they publish books across a wide range of Christian perspectives. Rather than digging in on one viewpoint, They aim to further conversations and inspire wonder. The authors who work with Brazos are scholars, thinkers, artists, and activists who bring expertise and practicality to the books they write. Right now, Curiously Caitlin listeners can get 30% off all Brazos books, including mine and Sky's books, as well as other recent Holy Post guests, including Matthew Bates, Mike Cosper, Nijay Gupta, Scott McKnight, M. Daniel Carroll, Jessica Hooten-Wilson, John Ward, and Karen Swallow-Prior. 
visit www.bakerbookhouse.com slash theholypost to get 30% off your next book from Brazos Press. That's www.bakerbookhouse.com slash theholypost to get 30% off your next book from Brazos Press. And thank you to Brazos Press for sponsoring this episode. That is really helpful. Um, And to your point, I think an impulse we might have in a church if a kid asks this question, or if this is a reasonable question for an adult to ask too, Mm -hmm. might be to think in terms of, well, we're Adam and Eve historical characters, Mm -hmm. historical people um, or characters in a story. And I have to kind of answer that question first before I get to the logistical question that you are asking. And it sounds Mm -hmm. like part of what you're saying is that's not a question that the text seems very interested in in answering. And so let's pay attention to the structure of the text itself and what it's pointing us towards. And to the credit of this kid, they are kind of getting at something that it does seem to be important Mm -hmm. in the text, which is procreation. Um, So to answer their question in a kind of sideways way, because again, I think some of the question to, to what you've already said, we don't know, like we're not totally sure about all of this. But how would you answer their question of of kind of how did they know about babies or what, you know, were they right. babies in terms of what the text actually thinks is important about procreation? Like what is here yeah. that the text does want us to ask about that would be important for us to make sure we don't miss? Yeah. And I think this will actually be this is both controversial in evolutionary biology and <laughs> uh, for a lot of people in our culture today, for a lot of us uh, is you know, the image of this comes up and we can talk about Genesis one and then Genesis two and then Genesis four, uh, where, where, we, where we get the very first sex act actually described, but you can't blink or you'll miss it. Right. Um, <laughs> but Genesis one, it's, uh, they're created in the image of God, male and female. So I don't know what the image of God, I mean, I have friends who have written lots of stuff on the mm-hmm. image of God and I think I have some good ideas, but the text basically just says it's male and female, whatever that means. Um, But that's a controversial statement. Um, I mean, that's putting biological sex right at the heart of what it means to be a human and what it means to reflect God as a human. Is uh, there's something about God that has male and femaleness in Him, Mm -hmm. right, or in in it? If you want to say whatever the Godness is, for evolutionary biology, that's controversial because if evolution had gone correctly and efficiently, there would be no male female difference. There would Mm -hmm. be no sex. Nobody would ever have sex. Everybody would be self-replicating. Apparently, according to biologists, this is entirely possible that humans could be, there could be some form of a human that is self-replicating. I don't know what that human would look like or how it would work, but it's an embarrassment of evolutionary uh, thought that we've split up into two different sexes. And because it creates all kinds of problems for evolution. It's, It's onerous, courting rituals, people get killed because they have to wear long feathers because the girl likes it, you know, all this kind of stuff. All the things that kill lots of people today. Lots of problems. <laughs> yes, lots of problems because of sex. So and, and it's it's just inefficient on every it's it's bad on every account when it comes to kind of evolutionary tailoring. Uh, and I think for us as well, obviously in our cultural moment, this is a really hot point that like mm-hmm. biological sex splits up the world in some way. So really, where do you if you say where do you see sex and babies in scripture? Uh, you first see it uh, when God blesses the animals, and that it's, He doesn't command them to. I will point out too, there's no command to have sex. It says He blesses them to have sex, to be fruitful, multiply. Mm. Fruitfulness is a metaphor there for uh, for sexual procreation and actually something beyond procreation. Um, but He does it to the animals first, and then He also gives the same blessing to the humans later to be fruitful and multiply. So. The first thing we know about humans is they're male and female, which means they're sexually differentiated creatures. They're, you know, the uh, the male has to go with the female in some kind of biological way. And the next thing we know is they're blessed in order to have sex and for it to be uh, procreative, which means it produces, it makes babies. Um, Now, any reader of the Hebrew Bible or hearer, most people would have been hearing the scripture. Dr. Johnson sometimes uses the phrase Hebrew Bible, which is another way of talking about the Old Testament. Any mm-hmm. ancient hearer of the Bible would immediately understand that in Genesis 1. Um, any any adult, I guess, who understood sexual activity. Um, Genesis, so, you know, in some ways you could even say like, uh, it. well, I, you know, I've got four kids. I don't think it was unusual with kids that your kids start asking you questions about sex when they see animals having sex, Hmm. right? Hmm. So, and if you grow up in agrarian subsistence cultures, like animals having sex is not going to be foreign to you. You might even be forcing some animals to have sex in order to husband them, right? 
Um, so actually watching the patterns of the world brings questions of sex into the environment. Um, interestingly, nobody is sexually produced in Genesis 2 at all. They're crafted from the dirt and then crafted mm -hmm. from the side of the man. Um, but then the addendum at the end of that is, therefore, a man shall leave his father's and mother's house. And you're like, who, who are, what's a father and mother, <laughs> right? Again, the assumption is you're a later person, you're hearing about this, you know what they're talking yeah. about and shall sexually cling to their wife. And you could say, okay, why sexually cling to their life? Well, we already know from Genesis one. Um, and then, but the, we don't actually see the first couple have sex until Genesis four, first sentence. He knows because they use the euphemism of to know somebody is to have sex with them, including at Sodom and Gomorrah to sexually assault somebody is to yeah. know somebody can also mean sexually assault non procreatively. Um, so there's all this sexual language everywhere in this text. Uh, so it would be weird for them not to have some clue that this was going to come to or it was a giant it's going to be like the kid said it's going to be a giant surprise you know you ate too much fruit <laughs> one day and then you're like wow you're really packing on the fruit pounds i don't know um i do know that animals do not have to be instructed with sexual education mm. uh, and humans are animals according to scripture i mean we're in parallel well we're viewed in parallel to animals uh, as part of god's creation above other things you've said a couple of times and i just want to hear you talk a little bit more about this for people who might be unfamiliar, but you've said a few times, like the rabbis have these kinds of interpretations. Mm. Who are these people? And like, how, sh right. how should we think about how they are helping us interpret scripture? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Sorry, I just made that assumption there. Uh, <laughs> so the rabbis are all people who lived in the time of Jesus and beyond. We only have their writings from about 250 years after Jesus. That's where the earliest mm -hmm. sections of these begin. So we don't actually know. So you will get a lot of people who, who will talk about the rabbis as if they lived during the days of Jesus. Some mm -hmm. of those can be figured out because you can see Jesus responding to things that sound like later rabbinic teaching. Um, but I would say be very careful when you hear somebody hanging a sermon on, well, the rabbis taught this, therefore, because yeah. it's very difficult to know. Uh, so these are people a few hundred years after Jesus who are commenting on scripture. And it's really interesting, like, you know, one rabbi will comment and you can read that you can see it on the page. And another rabbi from 100 years later, 200 years later, will comment and say, I don't know what the heck this person's talking about. You know, Rabbi, <laughs> you know, Rabbi Eliezer said this, Yochanan uh, says this, but I think he's wrong. They argue with each other right on the page and they didn't, they didn't know each other. Like they're people who come in successive events. So they have these centuries long explorations where they're trying to figure out some of them are just asserting, here's what I think this text says. Mm -hmm. Here's what I think it means. Uh, and then other people are coming along going, well, I don't see that at all. Here's what I think it means. And I think the first person is wrong. Um, and this is actually, you know, if you want to, if you ever, like I was in New York city for a long time, if you ever see an Orthodox Jew in public reading something that looks like Hebrew, it is not the Bible. Uh, they're reading these arguments between these rabbis in Aramaic. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, it looks like Hebrew because it's written in the same script, but it's actually mostly Aramaic and it's these arguments between rabbis over the centuries. And they say all kinds of things because they're kind of gaming every verse and they take one verse at a time per page, one to two sentences per page, and they comment on it. And then they argue with each other all over the page. And it's a historical argument. And um, they say some crazy stuff because they're trying to work out every angle. Uh, and they really are. I mean, they think very deeply about these passages. That's helpful. And to your point, also helpful information for people to know when whether it's a pastor or a scholar or someone can make a point and appeal to the rabbis. And it's especially dangerous, I think, when they know that the people they're talking to might just take that as a source of yeah. authority and not ask They're not going to go look it up. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you for and that. And even if they did look it up, they wouldn't know how to, you know, read it. Yeah, so I'm I'm, yeah. I'm cautious when I think I appeal to the, I appeal to the rabbis as a, a whole set of voices that are doing really interesting yeah. things and help me think through the text as well. Well, and it's such a good example because part of what we're trying to do with this show as well is say we need experts, we need scholars. Um, everyone in churches is thinking theological thoughts and we need to learn from one another. But we also need people like you who are reading all of these folks and spending time knowing how to interpret what they're saying and knowing how to think well about how what they're saying does or doesn't apply to your understanding of the text. Mm. And not everyone has the time and ability to do that, but we're thankful for people who do. Um, so thank yeah. you for explaining that. Any 
last thoughts about these questions, like things we have not talked about that you think are important or things that if you were, again, not just responding to this child, but in a church where a child is asking this question and a bunch of grownups go, actually, yeah, I'm confused about that too. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you think is important? I don't think it's a a topic, but I think an issue that often comes up is uh, children are interested in babies and sexuality in general. And yet you have to always have age appropriate discussions, Mm -hmm. right? Like my mom was a nurse and at three years old, I asked her where babies came from. And she gave me like the full clinical story (laughs) and I was not ready for it. I think she told me, I just said, no, that can't be true. Uh, And uh, (laughs) so I think, but I also would point out, because I read Genesis every semester with my classes and a lot of Christians are not prepared for how um, blunt the discussion mm-hmm. of sexuality and sex is in Genesis through you know through Deuteronomy, um, and how much um, how much value is placed on fertility you know human fertility and again yeah. I don't think you know I, I worked I wrote a book recently on Darwin and natural selection I had to have a whole section where I talked about sexual reproduction which was actually a little bit darker of a journey than I was ready for because I. I hadn't really fully thought through how dark that conversation is in evolutionary biology and how mm. how the Bible actually kind of, you know, it puts f- sexual assault, both females sexually assaulting males and vice versa yeah. on full display and kind of lets you know what's really going on uh, and the possible outcomes of that. So I think sometimes when people ask questions like this, I, I want to both shield them from scripture and be like, you're probably not ready. You know, like I tell my students, don't read East of Eden until you're like 30 or 40, because you'll think it's, <laughs> you'll think it's too wild of a story to be true. And once you're older, you're like, oh, I know people like that. Um, mm. And I think it's similar with scripture. You, I, I think we need to be not so afraid of the kind of the sexual discussions, but scripture leaves them at a level where we can just go like, oh, bad stuff happens or good stuff can happen. And I don't think we have actually absorbed the impulses of sexuality in scripture yet. Like, so one of them that, that I discovered as I was researching it was we think in terms of procreation, because we think of nat- nuclear families, my children, uh, the yeah. biblical authors are almost universally focused on my great, great, great grandchildren that I will never meet. What, how, how am mm-hmm. I going to set things up for them? Right. And that has environmental impacts that has political impacts on how they think about uh, how they manage the land and, and everything, you know, and how they manage their relationships with the people around them. So I, I think um, something that starts out with where do babies come from? Did they know about babies? Actually, the biblical authors are like, great, that's a great starting point. Let's move into your great, great, great grandchildren. Let's talk about uh, talk about them. Yeah. Or, you know, um, or it, everybody's going to be in a family that's going to have great, great, great grandchildren, uh, whether you're the one producing the line or not. So um, they want to have that discuss. They want to have a bigger discussion than I think most of us are ready to have. And so I think it wouldn't be bad for us to take some of our cues for, for thinking about these things from them. That is really helpful. Thank you. Um, and a good word in general, I mean, beyond sexuality, too, with the fact that we often kind of brush aside some details in scripture if they don't feel comfortable to us. And sometimes it's the questions of kids that can force us to realize like, Mm -hmm. oh, no, if you just read this, it's provoking some important ideas and questions that we should take pretty seriously. Um, Thank you, Drew, so much for this. Thank you for taking seriously this really important question with me. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Caitlin. I love what Drew described so well in this conversation how to ask questions that the text actually prompts us to ask rather than getting distracted by the color of the Tic Tacs. But the very end here is crucial. This kid asked a question that was in some sense unrelated to the text, but he understood something important about the story of Genesis 1 and 2 that we can miss when we hyper-focus on our modern questions. He understood that procreation is a central part of the story. And as Dr. Johnson said, not just sexually, but in terms of humans taking what God created and creating more with it. And the text is not primarily interested in the nuclear family either. While it cares about marriage and children, Dr. Johnson pointed out how the frame of reference most people had throughout the whole story of scripture was one of generations beyond that nuclear family, the great, great, great grandchildren that a family would produce. One thing the first few chapters of Genesis seem very interested in is how humans respond to God's good creation, with fruitfulness and faithfulness or with death and destruction, not only for themselves and their children, but for generations to come. How will we take the gifts of God's creation, even as they and us are marred by sin, and do faithful work that outlasts us? 
When I was in Italy a few summers ago, I was captivated by beautiful cathedrals, huge, stunning works of art that took the medieval masons who made them decades, sometimes hundreds of years. The original architects sometimes never saw the finished product. Are we willing to work with future generations in mind? Are we willing to work faithfully knowing we might not see the fruits of our labor, healthy families, thriving communities, beautiful works of art, until eternity? Are we willing to work with faith that God will redeem our fallen and finite efforts, even if they appear to be failures here and now? Wrapped up in this kid's question, it turns out, is a rich theology of our life on earth and what faithfulness does and doesn't look like. Curiously, Caitlin is a production of Holy Post Media. Produced by Mike Stralo. Editing by Seth Gorvett. Theme song by Phil Vischer. Be sure to follow us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And leave a review so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary, plus cute kids, and never any butt news. 